Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dina Piminova. I'm the Senior Project Coordinator for the NYU Langone Community Health Worker Research and Resource Center housed in the Department of Population Health at the NYU School of Medicine and supported by NYU Langone Community Service Plan. On behalf of the CHWRRC and our co-sponsors, I want to welcome you to the final panel of our second CHW Innovation Summit with a focus on new frontiers for establishing a health equity workforce. Next slide, please. Um, a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, due to the nature of this being a Zoom webinar, everyone is on mute. To enable or disable closed captioning, uh, please select live transcript at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the chat box is open for comments and sharing of resources. Uh, please make sure to select everyone and not just host and panelists when using this feature. Uh, please use the Q&A box to submit questions to the speakers. Uh, we will have time to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion. Um, the slides and the recording will be made available at a later date uh, with the permission of the speakers. And lastly, please be sure to complete the survey at the end of the session. Um, next slide, and uh, I'm going to pass it on to today's moderator, uh, Romelia Carvacho. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. My name is Romelia Corvacho, and I am the program manager at NYU Langone Health, Beyond Bridges program. I have been a community health worker in various capacities for the past 20 years. An honor to be serving as your moderator this afternoon. A very warm welcome to all our panelists and attendees. My own experience as a new immigrant in this country, trying to navigate the challenging healthcare system brought me into the field of community health work and taught me the importance of having trusted advisors and advocates. For years, the community health worker community struggled for recognition and visibility. We used to say, we are always on the menu, but never at the table. But programs like the ones you are going to hear about today are a testament to how much we have learned and I still have to learn about the value of CHWs and what they bring to our work. I look forward to exciting and informative presentations. Um, yeah. you, will, you will be hearing our panelists to talk about who, what, and how centering CHWs in defining and measuring impact. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a longtime friend and colleague, Noel, Noelia, Noelita, recently. And um, she has been a leader for the CHW movement for years and has accomplished great strides in advocating for the CHW workforce. So let me find So Dr. Noel Wiggins, has over 35 years of experience working on teams that use popular people's education, the community health worker model and participatory research and evaluation to advance health and educational equity. From 1986 to 1990, Anuel supported community health workers in a rural area of El Salvador. She spent the next five years directing a CHW program in rural Oregon. Noel served as an associate director of the landmark National Community Health Advisor Study and co-wrote the study chapter that identified the core roles of CHWs. Noel co-founded the Community Capacitation Center at the Multnomah Community Health Department and served as, a, as its director from 1998 to 2017. Noel is currently the co-principal investigator of the CHW Common Indicators Project. She has co-written multiple peer-reviewed publications about popular education and CHW profession. Noel has a BA from Yale University, a master's from the Harvard School of Public Health, and a doctorate in educational leadership from Portland State University. And I also have the pleasure to introduce to you Penny Jewell. She currently serves as a community health representative in Fulton, Michigan. 
She is a certified CHW through Michigan Community Health Worker Alliance, has over 30 years of experience in community health, providing advocacy, care coordination, direct care, health education, social support, capacity building and case management, and has an associate degree in human services. Penny has been a strong advocate for CHWs and has contributed to and prom promoted assessment and evaluation to the CHW role and scope of practice. She has also created and developed a culturally tailored group program for adults with limited abilities and manages a child passenger safety program. Penny is a member of the CHW Common Indicators Project leadership team, which contributes to the integrity, sustainability, and viability of CHW programs. So without further ado, uh, Penny, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to welcome all the participants and thank you so much for asking us to be here to present today. Um, our portion of the presentation is an introduction to the Community Health Worker Common Indicators Project. Um, and I was already introduced, so I just thank you for that really warm and heartfelt introduction. Um, right now, we're just going to go over very quickly the objectives and what we want to accomplish today in our presentation. So if we could go on to the next slide. Um, right, so we just, we want to make sure that everyone, by the end of this uh, presentation that everyone's familiar with the history and aims, the current status, the recommended indicators for the CI project, um, understand how the project models community health worker leadership of research and evaluation about our own profession, and then just feel motivated and know how they can get involved. So on the next slide, we just have um, the, our agenda today after our little introduction. We're going to actually do a brainstorm, hear a little bit about um, our background, um, talk about centering CHW leadership, and then we'll conclude. So in all of our work for the Community Health Workers Pro um, CI project, we use popular or people's education. And that is a philosophy and a methodology for education and organizing. Um, it shares many roots with uh, the community health worker profession. Um, it's a little bit hard to use popular education when we can't see participants, but we're really gonna do our best to try to even use it today in this presentation. So as you can see, what popular education means is that we we just we always want to start with what people already know and we really value that um, everybody is a teacher and everybody is a learner um, we always want to pool our knowledge use it to create a more just society and then whether it be at a virtual room or a real room um, we want to just always balance that participation and power around the room so I am going to go ahead and um, pass you over to Noel, unless there are any questions. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Penny, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I share Penny's gratitude to Romy for those lovely introductions and to all of our colleagues at the NYU Langone Medical Center for inviting us to participate today. Um, as Penny mentioned, in all our work in the Common Indicators Project, we use popular or people's education. And one of the main ideas of popular or people's education is that no matter who we are, we all know a great deal based on our life experience. And for that reason, um, as educators and organizers, we should always start with what people already know. Um, now, I'm sure that you can think of lots of benefits of starting with what people already know, um, one of them is that we don't have to waste time covering things that people already know. Um, and it also really um, enacts that principle of valuing um, the existing knowledge in the room. So to find out what you already know about our topic, we're going to use a brainstorm. And I'll ask to move to the next slide. So very quickly, um, we would like for you to write in the chat an answer to this question. What do we already know or imagine about the Community Health Worker Common Indicators Project? 
Now, we happen to know that there are a few of our advisory group members in the, in the group today. Um, and so they can lead off if they'd like to, but we also imagine that all of you may be able to um, share some knowledge about the Common Indicators Project uh, based on just the, the name of the project. So let me check into the chat. Um, ah, so Adam says, I know how to find and download it. I still need to read it, LOL. Okay, Adam, great. Uh, Nadia says, it assesses CHW impact and engagement beyond health outcomes. Yes, okay, I'm seeing some nothings and some zeros, that's great. Uh, one person says, I don't know anything, but I'm ready to learn. Maya says, building a common understanding about the value of community health workers on community health and developing standardized measures that we can reuse across our communities. Um, Sophie says, I'm unsure what this project is about. Okay, that's just fine, Sophie, we'll be sharing more. Um, I'm seeing another answer. The aim is to evaluate the impact of community health workers, maybe through increased access to care. Um, I'm interested in knowing more about the take up of the common indicators, yes. So let me just leave one more moment. Uh, measure the impact that is not usually measured. Thank you, yes. And uh, ready to learn, great. Okay, so that was wonderful. A wonderful example of brainstorming even in this uh, setting where we can't see one another. So thank you so much for that. Um, so now I'd like to just share some background information about our project to add to what people have already shared. So next slide, please. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, there's now over 60 years of research documenting the beneficial outcomes of community health worker programs it, just in the US. And this is not even to mention the research about community health worker programs outside the United States. However, despite progress in documenting those outcomes, there are still several important gaps in the research. Um, for example, the lack of standardized measures to assess community health worker practice has made it um, hard to impossible to combine or aggregate data across programs and regions. And we believe that that has impeded commitment to sustainable long-term funding of community health worker programs. In addition, the lack of easy to use indicators makes it harder for community-based programs to report outcomes to funders and policymakers. And we would be happy to make available a copy of the slides afterwards. Thank you for that request. Um, a third factor is a lack of attention to the processes by which community health workers achieve outcomes. And that's made it difficult to demonstrate the importance of particular CHW roles, skills, and qualities. And finally, a lack of community health worker involvement in all stages of research and evaluation has meant that community health worker studies and evaluations have lacked that crucial perspective of those who are closest to and most informed about the work. Next slide. For all those reasons, in 2015, 16 community health workers, researchers, and others from five states came together for a two-day meeting in Portland, Oregon, and established the Common Indicators Project. Our purpose, as Romy already stated, is to contribute to the integrity, sustainability, and viability of community health worker programs through the collaborative development and adoption of a set of common process and outcome indicators for community health worker practice. Next slide. We've been working steadily since 2015. In 2019, we received funding from the CDC, which has allowed us to progress much more quickly. During this time, we have developed a list of process and outcome constructs or concepts. We've developed 12 specific indicators to measure some of those constructs. We've piloted our indicators with multiple pilot sites, both CBOs and state health departments. And um, one very exciting development is that the community health worker survey for the co uh, community health workers for COVID response and resilient communities project 
which is funded by the CDC, um, which will be conducted with over 1,000 community health workers in the spring of 2023, actually includes all of our workforce indicators. So we're very excited about the data that's going to come out from that survey. Um, in addition, we've built a national constituency of more than 280 community health workers, researchers, evaluators, um, and others who are committed to um, identifying and using common process and outcome indicators. And finally, we've presented at a lot of conferences and we've published a number of journal articles and blogs. Next slide. So on this slide, you can see our 12 priority indicators, which are divided into process and outcome. They measure three overarching constructs, and those are community health worker workforce conditions, or the conditions that community health workers need to make optimal contributions to communities and to healthcare systems. Uh, the second uh, overarching construct is the outcomes that community health workers are unique, uniquely able to achieve, such as empowerment and increasing social support, and the policy and systems conditions that support a thriving community health worker profession. Next slide. As, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we're missing a slide here, but that is not a problem. Um, and I will just pass it on at this point to Penny to share about how the project centers community health worker leadership. Penny, back to you. Thank you. Okay, right. So my, probably the thing I'm most excited about is how from its inception, the Common Indicators Project has always involved community health workers. Um, our structure currently includes a six person leadership team and half of that are members that are CHWs. Um, there's also a four person uh, CHW council um, and they get to provide additional input into our decision making. Um, we have an advisory group um, that has CHWs that meet bi-monthly and we get around 40 to 50 people each time. Um, we are guided by our racial equity lens and by popular or people people's education principles. And um, also we, we provide on the job training and about research and evaluation for CHWs and then mentorship and sponsorship um, and support for community health workers that want to obtain those advanced degrees in research oriented fields. Um, so this next slide um, is my story. Um, so I actually, I struggled with what I wanted to say, and I am going to try to keep this short, but I recently discovered that I actually have like a lot to say, um, and that is all thanks to the support and the encouragement of my um, Common Indicator Project family. Um, as was mentioned, you know, I have done community health work for over 30 years. But only within the last like seven or eight years did I realize it actually had a name. And I know this is true for many other people. Um, for a very long time, I was really convinced by the words and actions of other professionals that my experience and skills were not enough that I deserved a seat at any table, um, basically because I just didn't have a bunch of letters after my name. Um, I didn't really question that. I just accepted it. Um, but then when I was chosen to be a member of the leadership team two years ago for the uh, Community Health Worker Common Indicators Project through uh, a whole process that I can only refer to as designed by a higher power and that's just too long of a story, but um, I just being on this project has given me a voice where I didn't feel like I had one before. Um, being on the team has given me an opportunity to contribute and use my voice to offer input and give feedback on important work that's happening in my own field. Um, the mentorship has, you know, just supported me, encouraged me to continue to lift my thoughts, my concerns, my ideas, my entire voice, even when I wasn't really super comfortable because I didn't feel, feel like I was well spoken enough or just I'm new to it and nervous. Um, the, passion I have for this project is hard to even explain. The opportunities are 
just incredible and endless. Um, and, it, and it's not just some kind of a, a tokenized like representation, but it's meaningful, authentic involvement, um, like presenting here for you. Um, being able to learn about research and evaluation, popular education, having that input on publications, co-authorship, being part of a national initiative for community health workers, so many examples. Um, before I even joined, you know, I had only done two presentations ever in front of maybe 15 people. This project has helped me gain confidence I never had before and a voice I never used before now. Um, I do feel like community health workers, community health representatives, we've kind of been pushed aside and kept out of conversations about our own profession for a really long time. But now, now that we have these amazing allies, the CI project and everyone here today, um, they're, they're eager for our input and our feedback. So I just want to tell all of the community health workers in the room today, you know, to take those opportunities, make those opportunities for yourself and share your voice. Don't, don't be dismissed. Don't be afraid that you don't sound educated enough, professional enough. Just know you're valued, that CHWs are the key. They're the glue that holds the communities together. Um, I just really can't express in words how grateful I am, how blessed I feel to um, have become a member of this team. And, you know, it just really has literally changed my life. So thank you for letting me share that. Um, and with that, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that we do really welcome um, everyone to join the advisory group. And I think on the last slide, I don't know if we actually shared, thank you, but I, our uh, contact information is chw common indicator at gmail.com. And we can make sure to put that in the chat if that's not on our last slide. But thank it you so be much. On the last slide. Okay. Okay. But thank you. So <clears throat> now we have the pleasure to introduce Christian Caputescu. Uh, he is a postdoctoral scholar in the Interdisciplinary Center for Innovative Theory and Empirics at Columbia University, where he works on trust and mistrust of experts and science at Columbia. He, is also, he also co-directs the Trust Collaboratory, a newly launched center studying the social dynamics of trust with a focus on medicine and science, media and journalism, and technology and algorithm. Christi, Christian earned his PhD in history from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. This summer, Christian was a lead organizer of the Trust Workers Projects, a photo voice exhibition at the Forum in Man Manhattanville dedicated to highlighting the conditions under which, which community health workers build, maintain, and use trust in their daily work as trusted bridge builders in their communities. So Christian, take it away. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to thank the organizers of the summit, Dina, Amy, Romelia, thank you so much for the invite and the opportunity to talk about our CHW project at Columbia, which featured um, a photo voice exhibition this summer, as you can see on the slide, titled Trust Workers, featuring CHWs at the fr front lines of the public health system. Um, and let me also make a shameless plug at the beginning of my talk. You can find this exhibit online at trustworkers.org. Um, and before starting, I also should mention that this project was a collective endeavor. I was very fortunate to work with an amazing team of colleagues, Gileal, Jack LaViolette, Danielle Thompson from Columbia, and our amazing scholars and staffers at Insight, as well as community partners, among them nonprofit health organizations such as Bronx Community Health Network, BCHN, 
public health scholars like Elizabeth Cohen and Judy Gomez, and many, many wonderful CHWs from across New York City. So we came to this project because we were interested in the problem of trust. Um, and the question is maybe why trust? Why, why uh, worry about trust? And the answer is we have heard a lot about a crisis of trust in vaccines, in experts, in doctors, in hospitals, and in science since the beginning of the pandemic. pandemic. So think for instance about the COVID-19 vaccination campaign that began early last year and the massive resistance, resistance it encountered in, in parts of the public. Um, and this crisis of trust in the medical system was something we were keenly interested in better understanding. But we wanted to do this in a way that was different from the approaches focused on studying, probing, addressing what seemed to drive this crisis. And you've probably heard this term mistrust a lot. Um, and our premise was that by not paying attention to what actually trust is, how it is built, maintained, and repaired when absent or broken, we would never get beyond knee-jerk and often frenzied attempts to counter mistrust. Worse even, we would be playing an endless game of whack-a-mole each time we encountered a new variant of mistrust in the medical system, um, consider the many permutations of mis and disinformation that continuously replicate and create new variants of falsehoods in the public square. So how would you go about to make sure that all of these different millions of little lies and stories would be addressed and the mistrust behind them would be, uh, uh, yeah, well, erased or combated? Um, so that's how we thought about the problem of trust and mistrust, where trust is that which needs to be explained first before rushing into problem solving mode. So then what is trust? And the answer is we don't know really. Um, and this might surprise you because there is a formidable industry of polling, sentiment reports and surveys that continuously tells us otherwise. They tell us that trust is something that can be measured like temperature or gravity with quantitative tools, preferably, preferably ranked on a Likert scale. Um, and that view assumes that trust is a fixed attitude. But as social scientists, and in my case, as a historian, we're a little bit skeptical about, um, about going about this topic this way. We think that trust is much more context dependent, fluid, changing. Trust is actually quite messy and complicated in people's everyday lives. And sometimes it is confounding to see how people say they mistrust the medical system, but then they go on and take their medication daily without thinking twice about mistrust. So that's why it's necessary in our mind to spend time to listen to the sort of idiosyncratic ways of how people think about trust and use it as a method to make sense of reality in their daily lives. Um, and that brings us to CHWs. We should listen in particular to people who use trust, like CHWs, in their daily work. Being trusted and trustworthy is literally written into their job description. And therefore, it is really, it is really valuable and, and, and useful to look at how CHWs could provide sort of a window into this complex, complex topic of trust, which involves attending to the often sort of indirect and protracted and unseen ways in which CHWs build and use trust to act as bridge builders and mediators in our communities. So if polls and surveys aren't the best way of getting to that fine grained picture of how CHWs use trust and think about trust, well, then how else would you do it? And this is really, um, the kind of problem that we spend quite a bit of time thinking about and worrying about. And we opted for a research methodology call, called uh, photo voice to get to that problem. So let me tell you just a bit what, what that means and what it entails. We organized four workshops in the spring this, uh, this year with over 60 CHWs from across New York City and worked in groups and one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. And the goal was to use this technique of photo voice to create a series of personal stories that combine visual and written material into sort of personalized intimate accounts, into testimonials about how each CHW encountered trust in their day-to-day -day work. 
Um, if you could do the next place, side slide, please, then we can see a bit of that in our, this was our trust uh, workers exhibit at the forum in Manhattanville. Um, and what these intimate testimonials highlighted was that trust is the result of deeply relational work. Um, next slide, please. Um, these, these stories tell, uh, told us and showed us that trust requires long-term commitment and cannot be gained overnight. And even CHWs who hold it need to be careful in wielding trust because they are put by hospitals, clinics, and health providers in the difficult and sometimes really impossible position of mediating, which includes, includes communicating constantly changing medical information to the public without being perceived as, as overly biased or partisan even. And all of this work requires an enormous amount of social skills, finesse, local knowledge, cultural fluency, emotional labor, and mental strength. And I hope this brings me really full circle to sort of the point of this, uh, this panel, the question of impact and how to measure it. Uh, when we speak about impact, I think we really need to be very careful not to forget that these important contributions on the individual level often remain hard to capture through standardized measurement techniques like Likert scales. Um, and what we're really left with then is a mandate, I think, to all of us to think deeply about new ways to study how CHWs contribute to social change in our communities and how to make that work legible to the academic world, to policymakers, and to the public. Thank you very much. And I would like to share now a um, pre-recorded video of one of our CHWs, Donald Caro, who was unable to join us today. But we have his story recorded at trustworkers.org. And I would like to play it for you. I think it's incredibly touching and to the point. So let me just start it for all of you in a second. Um, and give me one second to do that. Uh, work for Bronx Community Health Network as a community health worker. Um, how did I get into this position? Uh, it kind of found me. Um, I'm a person that uh, never saw myself working uh, in social services or working with communities, but it was something that found me at a young age, in my early 20s. Um, not knowing what to do when I got out of high school, kind of kind of went for any position, didn't want to go to college. Uh, mom gave me an ultimatum to uh, either be homeless, go to work, or go to school. So I didn't want to be homeless. <laughs> I didn't want to go to school, so I went to work. And every job that I ever had previously before getting into this type of position was uh, people, dealing with people. Um, if it wasn't a security guard, concierge, porter, administrative assistant, assistant program, it all had to deal with people. So, and their problems too. <laughs> so it was always something that came uh, a part of what I was already doing, not knowing I was being trained to do it. So um, bumped into uh, a friend who's a pastor who said, hey, I got a position for you. I know you never did this work before. I want you to be a part of this. Uh, you know, I got to, you know, working with juvenile youth, that's how I started. And working with uh, the community, especially the Bronx, because I'm from the Bronx, born and raised. So I was able to start working with juvenile youth. Um, and it just took off. And I never looked back, uh, working with all different type of populations. And, um, and actually landed just recently with uh, Bronx Community Health Network. They kind of... Uh, brought me on board and it's been a good ride since I've been with them and working with the population that we work with and uh, working with a borough that I love and uh, and uh, be able to just love back, you know, the community that I, I was raised in. And uh, so this position definitely chose me. I didn't choose it. It was definitely a calling that God put in my lap because I wasn't looking for it. Um, but I love people. I see people in the eyes of, uh, of family. The Bronx is my family, and I'm there to serve them. 
Um, and I've also worked in, uh, in secular and faith-based organizations. Um, and I'm actually clergy, a pastor who's, you know, called to the Bronx to work with the Bronx and to serve the least, the last, and the lost people of the Bronx. So it's an enjoyment. I love it. Can't do nothing else but it. <laughs> The photo voice. Kristen, you're on mute. Kristen, you're on mute. Okay, uh, I just wanted to say I'm just going to stop it right here. We have more of this wonderful interview and many more on our website if you want to take a look. Um, thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and our next presenter is Dr. Chirima Ibe. Is an assistant professor. She's an assistant professor of general internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health, with a joint appointment in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is a core faculty member of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity and serves as an associate director of a stakeholder engagement. Her program of research is based on support community health workers efforts to address cardiovascular disparities. This is achieved by elu elucidating the degree to which dimensions of the encounters between community health worker and patient communication influence cardiovascular and patient-centered outcomes, and exploring this applica the application of implementation science principles and frameworks to discern intrapersonal, interpersonal, and institutional factors affecting community health workers' integration into healthcare teams. Dr. Eber received her BA from the University of Pennsylvania and her PhD from the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Also, I have the pleasure to introduce Tiffany Scott, who will be co-facilitating this, um, this session. And Mrs. Scott is the co-founder and present, present chair of the Maryland Community Health Worker Association. She has served as a vice chair of the Maryland CHW Advisory Committee since 2018, and is currently the interim chair of the Maryland CHW Accreditation Committee. She's also the first Maryland CHW ambassador to the National Association of Community Health Workers. As a CHW consultant and master trainer, she has extensive ex expertise mentoring and supervising community health workers and have trained over 200 CHWs. Ms. Scott is the first certified CHW in the state of Maryland and has worked in various practice settings, including federally qualified health centers, managed care organizations, and national organizations. So Dr. Shirima and Tiffany, take it away. Thank you so much, Romelia. Um, it's truly an honor to be here with you all and to be co-presenting with uh, my wonderful friend and colleague, um, Tiffany Scott. We're really honored to be here and we're really thankful to um, NYU for the invitation. We're pleased to be sharing about a project that is currently underway at a local clinic here in Baltimore, the Affirm Project, a family first initiative and realizing medical social equity. Next slide. So during our time together, what I'm hoping that we'll be able to do is to contextualize in terms of giving the background on the justification for and the key components of the Affirm Project, and then to discuss how our principles have guided the development of the Affirm Project and highlight how we have collectively made an effort to center community health workers at the forefront of developing this intervention, um, helping to prepare the organization to receive it, and really thinking critically about the evaluation strategies. Next slide. So I think it's always appropriate when we think about the role that community health workers play and um, and just on kind of undergirding our understanding in the uh, bell hooks. So I'm sure many of you are really familiar with who bell hooks is or um, was. Unfortunately, she passed last year. 
She was um, a world renowned um, black intersectional feminist who wrote a book um, that came out in 1984 called From Margin to Center. The cover of that book is on this slide. The quote that you see underneath is from the preface of that book. And it sheds light on this whole idea of what it means to be keenly aware of one's status in the margins. Now, what we know from her, this book and from her theory is what we're, we call the center margin theory. The center being that those who are in the center are automatically accepted in society, whether that's due to their race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual identity, ability, primary language, country of origin, and anything else that kind of grants access without effort. They don't have to do anything to remain in the center. Whereas those who are in the margins are not automatically included in the center due to the very things that make those who are in the center part of it without effort. When we think about what it means to center the margins in the context of community health worker programs and really public health interventions at large, it means that we're placing those who have systematically been placed in the margins at, and positioning them where they rightfully deserve to be, which is at the forefront of the work. Next slide. The quote that you see here is from a report that um, I had the pleasure of working on with a colleague of mine. And it basically, the, the quote is from this report. It's from what a community health worker said in terms of the roles that they play, that the community health worker serves as kind of the leaves. They understand the leaves of the tree, the tree being all the fundamental root causes that when they converge adversely affect people's health. And we see that very clearly in Baltimore City. That particular picture is a picture I took a few years ago of a neighborhood in East Baltimore. And unfortunately, not much has changed. Next slide. So again, thinking of the context of Baltimore City, um, and if you click next, another thing will pop up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm sure it's the case in many of the areas that um, many of you are coming from, but here in Baltimore, five miles, even less than five miles, makes a huge difference in health outcomes. You now, Baltimore is a city of neighborhoods and each neighborhood is really distinct from each other. Tiffany is from the west side and the areas that she's from, you know, they may share common characteristics with those communities on the east side, but it's like night and day in terms of how people feel about those particular um, neighborhoods. We also have to acknowledge that some of the differences that we see in the neighborhoods in Baltimore City are a lasting legacy of redlining and other discriminatory housing practices that actually preceded redlining. But it's left a, a lasting impact on Baltimore City, and it's really shaped the contours of the health disparities that we see here. And a lot of the, uh, the genesis of the AFFIRM project stems from this context. Next slide. So what we know about community health workers is very much akin to what Dr. Wiggins said earlier and what others have said throughout this conference. We, there's really no question about the level of evidence and the depth of ed evidence demonstrating that community health workers strengthen linkages between health systems and communities. We know that they mitigate the adverse effects, the, I'm sorry, the impact rather of adverse social determinants of health, meaning that we all have social determinants of health, but of course, the degree to which they affect us is not equally felt. We know that community health workers provide invaluable supports that improve disease self-management processes and outcomes not only among adults, but also among children. We see this particularly with asthma, and we also see this with maternal child health outcomes. What we need to know is how do community health workers support families and really doing this and examining this at the family level. So what prompted our project was really considering what it looks like to create programs that focus on families as a unit rather than on individual patients. 
and then thinking critically about how to develop and disseminate this model that focuses on addressing social barriers to care at the family level. Next slide. So these are some of the aims that the three project aims that are really form that form the basis of the Affirm project. And as a bit of an aside, I have the pleasure of co-leading this project with my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Nakia Shoal, who is the medical director of the Harriet Lane Clinic, which is where the Affirm project is being piloted. Our first aim is to co-develop and implement a family collaborative care intervention that involves primary care providers, social workers, and CHWs in federally qualified health centers and hospital-affiliated clinics. We then want to evaluate the impact of this intervention among families with complex medical and social needs across a multitude of outcomes. Um, and then finally, to identify barriers and facilitators of designing this program and implementing it so that it will inform broader scale implementation, translation, diffusion, all of those things in federally qualified health centers in the states of Maryland and New York. Next slide. The next couple of slides just provide a little bit of the details about this project. So as I mentioned before, this project is based at the Johns Hopkins Harriet Lane Clinic, which is a pediatric clinic in East Baltimore um, that serves a very diverse population, but a population that is predominantly minoritized um, with the growing um, Latinx community in East Baltimore. There are um, two, there are a number of partners, but the two that you see listed here are those affiliated with the Affirm Project through the Center for Health Equity and the Harriet Lane Clinic, as well as the Family Health Centers at NYU Lancome. So we have been working alongside our colleagues at NYU Langone to actually co-develop this intervention. So with the goal of actually scaling it to other settings, and we wanted to do this in a way where we were already, we were being informed by their insights over the course of developing the program. The participants are approximately a hundred. So we're looking at um, child or, um, parent caregiver dyad. So 100 participants that are um, from 50 households who seek care at the Harriet Lane Clinic. Next slide. The eligibility criteria along the lines of what I just previously mentioned is that they must be seeking care at the Harriet Lane Clinic and have at least two social needs or one social need and one chronic medical condition. And we have a number of primary outcomes, but just to kind of summarize, our outcomes are really focused on um, mental health and well being. So, uh, family functioning, anxiety and depression, symptomology, self reported stress. But we're also interested in appointment keeping for the sheer fact that that's something that we know that other stakeholders have an interest in. And then we're also concerned with the degree to which exposure to this affirm intervention affects um, participants' social support or self-reported social support and patient activation. Next slide. We're using a lot of different types of evaluation strategies, which are namely um, mixed methods in nature, really overlaid by an implementation science framework, as well as community-based participatory research. And we're trying to examine different dimensions of the program at the family level, at the level of the providers who are interfacing with the community health worker, and at the organizational level. And now I'll turn it over to um, my wonderful colleague and partner, Tiffany Scott. Thank you, Dr. Ebay. So we're going to talk about some of the uh, core principles, which will be on the next slide. Um, the co-creation of shared learning and transparency and trustworthiness within and between Hopkins and Baltimore and the clinics and the care teams that we're working with, authentic engagement with patients, families, CHWs, providers, and other key stakeholders is very important to the Affirm project, as well as uplifting CHWs as an essential 
part of the family social needs, especially for those with children with complex medical needs. Next slide. And our leadership, our CHW leadership is very important to uh, support this project, training the Harriet Lane residents and staff on working with the firm CHW, uh, developing intervention protocols and components, organizational competence, also working, I'm sorry, I, my screen, also doing some survey preparation, outcome selection, a logical model development and interview guides a development to ensure that our CHW is prepared to assist each family as they move forward throughout the program. Next slide. And so with the CHW uh, leadership as well, we have intervention protocols that we have developed and that we're utilizing uh, for this project. And it shows every aspect of the protocol development draws from a CHW's experience and their expertise, frequency of encounters between the firm CHW and the firm participants, process of linking families to needed resources and care coordination strategies. Next slide. CHW leadership also uh, entails some organizational readiness. So talking to the pediatric residents of the Harriet Lane Clinic and advising them and giving them information about what is a CHW, who are they? What is it that they do? Um, why are CHWs, CHWs needed? How to involve them in your CHW, how to involve the CHW in decision-making? And what are some of the best practices? Just not putting them on paper as I'm involving them or making them a part of the care team, but actually how do you effectively integrate the CHW into your care team to where they feel as though they are a vital member of the team? Next slide. Some evaluation strategies, reviewing and jointly determining what measures to include in participation survey and interview guides, collaborating on development of a firm's project logic model and identifying appropriate outcomes of interest that are aligned with CHW's model of support. Next slide. Practical tips. All right, leverage. Embed, ensure, and pay is some practical tips that we're using for the firm project. Next slide. And in conclusion, we want to support the health and overall well-being of every patient, client, family who bring who has the need to build in our programs and systems that center the margin. So we really want to be effective with everyone that participates within the program. CHWs we know are essential to this process. CHWs are natural leaders and must be recognized as such. Ensure that they are at the forefront of every phase of the program development and implementation and ensure that their expertise is as valued as that of any other member of the project team. We have some special acknowledgements on the next slide. We have our firm project team. This is a picture that uh, we had the opportunity to take when we did a site visit to NYU over the summer. We have the Family Health Centers at NYU Langon. We have John Hopkins Center for Health Equity, John Hopkins Harriet Lane Clinic, Johnson & Johnson Foundation, and the Maryland Community Health Worker Association. And I remiss in failing to include Dr. Karen Robinson, Director of EPC, as well as DeWan Munro, a CHW that we have worked closely with in the past year, who helped us define and our thinking of some research questions for this project. Next slide. And if you want more information and to stay connected with this project, feel free to use this information below. Thank you. Wow. Penny, Miss Scott, Donald, who wasn't able to be, well, was not able to be here with us for 
Thank you so much for bringing your experience, your wisdom and lived experiences. And, you know, and Noelia and Christian and Ch Dr. Chirima, um, thank you for allowing us or allowing the CHWs to be at the, at the table and not only in the menu. So it, this is amazing. I, I am so excited and honored to, um, to participate in this, in this panel and uh, to be your moderator. So thank you for sharing this amazing and important information regarding our beautiful field and the CHW model. So thank you so much. And I am going to, I think um, now we would like to allocate some, um, some time for questions. And these questions are for all panelists. So, um, so let me see the first question says, proving to systems and funders, the effectiveness of CHW programs can be challenging when so much of the conversation is focused on ROI, uh, return on investment. How do you handle these conversations when engaging funders and developing your projects? Projects. Are these conversations ongoing? I'll take a stab at answering this question because I see everyone smiling and no one, um, <laughs> but I think we're all smiling because we know it is a challenge. So. Um, for us with the Affirm project, we're really fortunate that um, we're working, we are funded by the Johnson & Johnson Foundation, and we worked with project officers who really understood and appreciated our vision for centering community health workers, and also centering the notion that we really needed to focus on addressing social determinants of health as a vehicle for addressing health outcomes and not the other way around. So we've been, we've been fortunate to have ongoing conversations with the project officer. There's been a little bit of um, flux in terms of who is in that role, but every time someone has been in that role, we've met with them. We've kept them abreast of what a firm is about. And I will also say that having Tiffany be a key member of the team Oh, sorry, something happened with my screen. Having Tiffany be a key member of the team and really a leader in the team has been essential because she has been so thoughtful about who all of the relevant stakeholders are beyond what we might initially envision. And her voice, frankly, is a lot more powerful than even those of us in academia. They're used to hearing from us. They're used to hearing evidence they're not always used to hearing from the people who are directly engaging with people who need the kinds of supports that CHWs receive. So um, I don't know, and I know I just called you out, Tiffany. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that, but um, I hope that answers some of your question, Romelia. Yes, thank you, Dr. Chirima. Anyone else would, you, would like to answer that same question? Romy, I'd love to build on what Dr. Ebay was saying, um, but I didn't know if Tiffany, if you wanted to go first. Okay, all right. So um, I think, first of all, it's just, it's important to point out that we already have a number of well-designed studies that demonstrate a healthy return on investment from community health worker programs. Those exist, they've been done. Um, but I also think that we really need to uplift the fact that it seems that ROI is a much bigger discussion when it comes to community health workers than when it concerns other health professionals. And I think we need to ask why that is. And I think we need to look into the roots in racism and misogyny and classism, since the majority of community health workers are women of color and they're members of other marginalized and racialized communities, as Dr. Ely pointed out. Um, and I also think that while outcomes like return on investment and medical utilization can be important outcomes in some settings, 
when community health workers are asked to choose the most important outcomes for their communities, they tend to choose outcomes like increased power and empowerment and increased social support and improved material conditions. So that's why in the Common Indicators Project, we've really tried to pay attention to the outcomes that are most meaningful for community health workers and for their communities. And Penny, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that. I actually just want to thank Dr. Wiggins for <clears throat> calling a thing a thing because I think a lot of the effectiveness, the interest in whether or not community health workers are an effective, like the role that they play is effective. Who, what's the basis of this question? If the, if community health workers could be packaged into a drug, they would have demonstrated effectiveness a million times over. So why, you know, what is really happening here? And I think you're absolutely right when you call out racism, sexism, and even considering the work of Bell Hooks as an intersectional feminist and the way that we frame why these questions keep coming up for this particular workforce, we just have to, I, I love that you said that in your response and thank you for even mentioning that. Thank you, Noelia, absolutely. So, um, and Dr. Chirima, so the next question that we have here says, what factors do you think contribute to successful CHW interventions? And what do you think gets in the way? This question is to me. Anyone in the panel that would like to answer? I mean, no, thank you. I, I wanted to make sure I heard you correctly. And frankly, I think some of what um, Dr. Wiggins just said, they, some of those factors are a barrier. Um, so in terms of the things that are, I think, contribute to successful community health worker interventions, I've noticed, and I, I would really love to hear what Penny and Tiffany think from their expertise, that the things that are effective in one realm are actually effective in another. And there are common things like ensuring that a supervisor is at the table who really has an, a strong understanding and appreciation of who community health workers are and their unique contributions to supporting patients and clients. The other thing is the organizational readiness piece. You know, Tiffany and I were fortunate to co-present to the pediatricians. Um, it's a pediatric residence clinic. So the pediatric residents at the Harriet Lane Clinic. And it was a wonderful opportunity because they're junior in their careers. And this is the prime time for them to really become acclimated to the work that community health workers do. Um, so things like just being aware of who a CHW is, ensuring that they're um, a key part of the decision-making process. One of the things that Tiffany always stresses is that you should be, they should be consulting with the CHW at the same level that they consult with their colleagues who are physicians or social workers or nurses. So really viewing them as essential. The other thing that I think is also critical is the slide where Tiffany talked about um, some of the practical tools that we've used. We don't think that any CHW who's a part of the team should be paid less than those of us who are the investigators. So I'll just leave it at that because that's an, an equity issue altogether. Um, but suffice it to say, we're all being paid roughly the same amount to be in this project because all of our expertise is valuable. Um, those are some of the things that I think, um, and I think in terms of what serves as barriers, everything that Dr. Wiggins said serves as a barrier. When you have people in the, in the, who are working in the programs that um, have either implicit or frankly explicit biases that are classist, that are racist, that is fundamentally going to affect the degree to which they're willing to collaborate with the CHW and embrace what they have to offer. So I'll leave it at that. And I'm, I'm really eager to hear what Penny and Tiffany think as well, but, and Dr. Wiggins too, and Dr. Cup, mm, forgive me. 
Capo Tesco. Christian. Mm -hmm. Christian is fine. Christian. <laughs> so I'd be happy to um, give some input on that. So, like from my perspective, you know, the factors that are contributing to successful interventions, if you want to call them that, uh, with CHWs, you know, I think that it also really starts with the actual CHW and their ability to create those trusting relationships with participants. So like the idea that, you know, you can be taught all these skills and whatever, but you can't really learn that genuine empathy, right? So that's just huge in itself, speaking on the CHW. But then, uh, you know, the like Dr. Chittima, you know, like you said, like the support from the supervisors. And so that really leads into like, we, we do have an indicator that, you know, is talking about supportive reflective supervision of um, community health workers and those supervisors knowing what community health workers do, what they need, having really been, you know, community health workers have that experience. Um, being a valued part of the team, integration into the team, the you know appreciation from the team, and so that we have um, actually an indicator for that also integration into health teams, um, definitely involving community health workers in decisions about their own programs and their own communities. We know what works, we know what doesn't. Um, so you know that's even getting into you know the policy and decision making and we have you know, ci project has those um i think it's oh my gosh number four and um the, is our decision and policy making indicator and then we have at the local and you know program level and state level um those workforce indicators so i mean definitely just you know I mean, I, I hate to say salary, but yeah, inequity in our salary, you know, we're the ones boots on the ground going out there doing all this work. And we're still like the lowest paid in our workforce. And it's just, it's, it's hard to feel appreciation and to contribute successfully when, you know, we're just, we're still thought of as lay people you know, and not really professionals at all. So um, if you, I mean, I love just talking about the things that contribute, but yeah, to go to the opposite of that, everything just the opposite of what I just said, you know, the lack of support, not being brought to the table, not having a voice, you know, not being accepted, people not even knowing what we do still, you know, that it's, so yeah, I could probably talk all day about that. So I'll go ahead and see if Tiffany wants to share anything. Sure, I have this um, famous quote that I always use um, when we talk about CHWs. And I tell all the CHWs that I talk to that if you don't have a seat at the table, you're being served on the menu. So if you don't fight for a seat, I don't care if it's a folding chair, if you're not there, then someone else is going to make a decision about your profession. And oftentimes it's not necessarily what we want. I've worked in a FQHC where I had five different supervisors within a matter of two years. And it was a matter of retraining each supervisor on what we do. A home visit, an hour. Many CHWs know you cannot do a home visit in one hour. That's like almost like not going to happen, but really having that supervisor that truly understands exactly what CHWs can do and allowing them to do it to the best of their ability. There is no glass ceiling for CHWs. Allowing CHWs to not just be CHW leads, but to be supervisors, to be leaders for the department, I think is something that most organizations don't feel comfortable with doing or they don't want to do or I don't really know why, but allowing the CHW role to stand flat-footed and stand strong. We have a great foundation. We know who we are. We know our scope of practice. We're not writing out prescriptions. We're not diagnosing people. We know our scope of practice. We know what we can do. 
just take your hands off and let us do what we do. It's been proven. It's been proven. It's not anything that's not written in any book, may not have all the dollars and cents that's needed, but allowing us to flourish, giving us those tools, even for that CHW that wants to be a supervisor and that has that drive, give them the tools, take them underneath of your wing, show them how to be a program manager, show them how to write grants, give them what they need to build their capacity and not keeping your thumb and keeping them just where they are is how I think you can be effective. Thank you, Ms. Scott. And I would like to add and echo you and also Penny, because also it's important, and you, we've been lucky to have uh, champions in our, in our place of work that allowed us and, and welcome our wisdom, our experience. But what do we do with those um, supervisors or managers that don't have the maturity or the understanding to welcome those um, attributes that we bring to the table. And I just made up the question, I guess. Maybe our leaders and also our CHWs too? Yes, thank you, Penny. Well, I just feel like, so that's when we, get, we have to just use our voices and just push back against that and say, listen, you know, and just, you know, it, it's really hard, right, to not be fearful to push back against, you know, the supervisors or the leadership in your organization. But that is what it's going to take is just using our voice to just not not accept it and, you know, do whatever we can. And there are so many allies and champions, like you said, in this work that we, we can find those people that will stand behind us and show all the reasons why this doesn't work this way. Thank you, Penny. Would you like to add anything, Noel or Dr. Chirima or Christian? You as, as leaders who respect the field and, 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 and welcome our experience and wisdom? I think first, just please call me Chitama. I <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. Um, you know, I really appreciated what Penny said about how we have a lot of champions. I actually don't think we have enough champions, and that's a lot of the problem, too. We have a lot of people who have the appearance, appearance of championing, but when push comes to shove and it's time to, you know, really bring the resources needed to support CHWs or call supervisors out for their poor treatment, of community health workers, they're nowhere to be found. And so I think part of it on our end, those of us who have the opportunities to be able to champion for CHWs in, in places where they might not ordinarily be welcomed is one, to bring them to these places, ensure that they're regarded as the leaders, but then also um, really talk to our own colleagues who don't understand or appreciate what who and what CHWs are and do. So I, I think there's, I think we need more champions. I think we do need more can champions. I, can, I add, can I add one thing to that? I think we need more champions, but I also think we need people to be open about their, their understanding of CHWs and to advocate for CHWs. It's great to be a champion, behind closed doors, but we really need you to be out in the front field. We need you to be on the battlefield right with us, advocating for us for equal rights, equality, better pay, uh, not living off of grants from one grant to the next, but being a sustainable part of someone's billing infrastructure. I think we need advocates to really speak out, not necessarily say, you know, you, I love CHWs. You guys are great, but really speak about it. When you present, talk about CHWs. Every chance you get, really inform people about CHWs and what we can do and what we have done, I think also helps spread the word. Thank you. Thank you, Meet Scott. Okay, so now uh, we go to the next questions. Uh, next question. Terms such as impact and outcomes are inseparable from how we talk about program evaluation. Do you think we need to move away from these terms? If so, what does that look like? Uh, 
any of our panelists? Maybe I can take this one. Um, being sort of an outsider to some of these conversations, as, as mentioned before, I am a historian and coming to this public health field for a very different place where the term impact is seen with a lot of suspicion and skepticism. And um, this is not to say that I see the value of impact and thinking about impact, but maybe the way impact is thought about in, especially in funder circles these days, um, should give us pause. And maybe we should think of ways to push back up, uh, against some of these framings that have smuggled in econ economic terms. And we should be uh, aware of where these things come from. It's not all just science, it's economic theory um, that is being introduced into how to measure human capacity, human quality, uh, the contribution of us as, as, as individuals. And RCTs, to be very honest with you, are exactly that. They are pretty much based on very narrow, um, short-lived, short-term frameworks of measuring impact that completely disregard long-term work that CHWs do. So when you ask, for instance, and in our case, well, um, measure the trust that CHWs are able to build in your community. Well, if you run an RCT, how are you gonna do that if your RCT runs for six months when, it, when trust, in fact, requires years of work? Um, so, so how is that possible? It's, it's impossible to do. Um, so I would encourage all of us when we see these kinds of framings, where we see the economics lurk behind these kinds of scientific ways of, of measuring um, impact to push back and maybe not apply for one of these grants and maybe not support an organization that, that does that kind of work and maybe have a conversation with a funder or a uh, officer in an organization and, say, and tell them point blank, look, this is problematic because we cannot do that kind of work and measure it. Um, so, and this is, I guess, for us academics, this is for policymakers, this is for everyone who's part of the scientific conversation to push back where we see these things uh, these kinds of barriers and and, and um, burdens imposed on us that are impossible to to really honestly measure and quantify. Thank you, thank you, Christian. And I see uh, Noelia, you have your hand up. Yeah, I I would love to um, follow on to what Christian was saying, and I want to thank Christian for sort of articulating a feeling that was sort of lurking in the back of my head that I hadn't quite been able to articulate that. Um, so personally, I don't necessarily think that we need to move away from talking about outcomes. Um, outcomes has a different, it feels different to me than impact. And I think it's for the reason that Christian is talking about that um, impact seems to bring along these sort of economistic, like, um, rationalist, materialist concepts with it. And, and they, they, words have power, right? And so we use these words and it starts to affect how we think about people. And so impact seems much more problematic to me. I think outcome doesn't seem problematic, but I think we need to talk about outcomes that are meaningful to community health workers and to their communities and the outcomes that community health workers are uniquely able to achieve. So that's uh, those are some of my thoughts on that question. Thank you, Noel. Anyone would like to add? I raised my hand to add something. Oh, oh yeah, no, that's okay. Yes, yes. I was really, um, I have to say, I was so struck by what Christian said because I couldn't help but think of that Audrey Lord. Um, quote of, you know, you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And I think about that a lot when it comes to the kind of work that we as community health worker researchers, the, the type of work we're undertaking. I, on the one hand, I do think it's, we have to really, like Christian said, interrogate the extent to which we're actually kind of buttressing these systems of power and oppression when it comes to the ways that community health workers are treated and um, and the lack and the suppression of their voice, right? On the other hand, I also feel like 
I don't know how else to put this, but sometimes I do think we do have to use their the oppressors' tools against them. You know, if if there's grant funding to be had for community health workers, those who have been community health workers need to be the ones getting the funding, and those of us who are advocates and champions should be the should be helping them secure that funding. And part of the reason I say this is that. Um, the work that Dr. Wiggins has done that, well, that Noel has done, that Christian has done, that Penny and Tiffany, um, and that you've done, Romelia, is so powerful and, and incredible. And what has happened in the wake of this COVID-19 pandemic is that you have a number of institutions stepping in and asserting themselves as experts in community health worker programs that and actually do not know anything about CHWs. So they're getting the funding and they're taking up resources that really should be going to community health workers themselves and to those who have a very nuanced understanding and appreciation for how to uplift them in the context of intervention development and delivery. So I'm really wrestling with this, with this notion and, um, and I'm just grateful to you, Christian, for saying that and for what you said as well, Noel, because I think it. I think we need to find a way to marry these approaches, given the realities that we're living in, and the the fact that unfortunately we are living in scarce resources. And if there are scarce resources, I don't want the resources going to someone who doesn't know and appreciate who CHWs are. I want it coming to people like us <laughs> in this group, and by us I mean those who are also participating in this session. So all of us, this whole like conference family. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chirimba. And um, okay, so we can have another question. And the next question says, how do you think CHWs and program participants can play a role in, in defining what success how an impact look like in their community? We kind of, I guess we talked about that a little bit, a lot. Um, how do you think CHWs and program participants can play a role in defining what success and impact look like in their community? Well, I'll start. So I think that that's like a pretty simple one, right? Make sure they're at the table, right? Make sure that not only the community health workers, but also even your community, right? Ask them, just involve them. I mean, it's, it, it seems like a really tricky question, but it's, it's really not. It just starts, it's very simple. CHW leadership um, at, all levels, you know, and and the community. I think it's really important to ask them, you know, what what success, you know, what success looks like to them, what they want. So, thank you, thank you. Sure. And I I want to add um, for CHWs. I've been telling CHWs this for a little bit is to document, document mm -hmm. the success, document mm -hmm. if it took you two hours to get the social security application done, like document mm -hmm. the success, document the time, document what the outcome was, even if it wasn't your anticipated outcome, document everything. Because I think we don't document, sometimes we under, we document what is requested, but there's more information that we can document to say, this wasn't an hour and a half visit. This didn't take three days to do. This took three weeks because this application, you needed a birth certificate, you needed a social security card and an ID. And we had none of these things. Mm -hmm. And so we had to get help to get all of these three things mm -hmm. before we could even complete the application. So I think documenting what we did, even the little one-step successors, we need to document so, so people can see that we're actually moving and not sitting still. And then I think that will also show our impact and our greatness. I think we under document a little bit 
um, what we truly, truly do on a daily basis for the community. Thank you, Ms. Scott. So I, I think this question will be for Christian. Um, do you think the notion of trust can be incorporated into how we measure effectiveness of, of CHW programs? I think it should be part of the conversation. I am not sure how we would measure trust though. That's really the, the key question that we've tried so hard to really come to terms with. And I don't think we really have an, uh, a fully fleshed out uh, answer to that question. So when you think about trust, really think of it as a like, uh, like um, individual method that all of us creates through the life experience through the encounters they have in life, through the education, through all kinds of things that happen in, in our daily comings and goings. So your uh, uh, trust methodology is different than mine. I can hold a glass confidently in my hand, I hope you can see it, <laughs> um, without uh, worrying that it breaks, right? Because I know that I've done this a million of times, but maybe you have held a glass previously that broke in your hand. So you don't actually trust the material, right? So there's so many little ways and things and experiences that, that construct the ways in which we trust or mistrust that I think this is something that needs like, almost like a collective project of many people that contribute their stories and their thinking to how they themselves built trust and use trust. And that's what we try to do with so many CHWs to understand not to take our definition of what trust is, but to listen to them, to take their stories and try to understand how they think about what trust is. And I think trust is, is very important because just make this one simple argument to any scientist, to any funder, to any uh, scientific institution uh, you encounter and come across. We were so convinced in 2020 that the United States one of, was one of the most or best prepared countries in the world to face the vaccine. Then we created the vaccine, then we rolled it out, and then people didn't take it. So what does that tell you about society? And what does it tell you about science and technology when we have all the science and all the technology and people still don't want the vaccine? What does that tell you about the kinds of people that we need on the ground that then actually can move the mistrust from slowly to that place where we hopefully can sort of inoculate them from something like a pandemic. So this is where, where trust comes in, but it's it's very difficult to measure. And I would be very happy to hear from you if you had ideas how to do it and how to make a better case that trust is central to medical care, to public health, to everything in our lives, really. Thank you, Christian. Does anyone, any of the panelists wants to chime in? I, I agree with you, Christian, and the reason I was snickering is that there's a medical mistrust index or scale, and I'm trying to remember if there's a medical trust one. Um, I think trust is such a multidimensional concept that it is really difficult to figure out how to measure it accurately, and that's probably one of the challenges of even incorporating measures of trust or any kind of means of of capturing trust because it is something that is influenced by your circumstances by your social identity um, by the context under which you've operated in life or the things that have been imposed upon you as a result of various factors outside of your control so i i, I that's just a thought that came to mind as you were talking thank you chirima um, Yes, no India. I'll just add to that. Um, I, I very much agree with all of the things that Christian has said about the complexities of measuring trust. And and also wanted to mention that there is some really interesting work that's being done about measuring trust in community health worker programs. And um, one example is some work that's being done by um, the Frontline Health Project. And I just dropped a link into the chat and they have, um, they have developed a measure of trust uh, in community health worker programs. So that's something that we might wanna look at. Thank you, Noelia. And now um, we are going to introduce Amy. 
are you? Thank you so much, Amelia. And thank you so much to our panelists for um, a mind blowing conversation, really. I, I um, wanna thank everybody for their time today and sharing their experience and expertise in this really rich um, conversation. I should have mentioned my name is Amy Freeman, sorry for folks who don't know, um, and along with my colleagues uh, in the Department of Population Health at NYU School of Medicine, um, Nadi Islam, Sue Kaplan, Sana Lin, um, Dina Pimanova, and um, Laura, along with Sarah, um, I lead the community health worker, co-lead the community health worker research and resource center. Um, and so I do just, again, really want to uh, express my gratitude for today's panelists and taking us through this really, um, you know, meaningful and rich conversation about centering CHWs in, in the research process in all aspects of community health programs, thinking about evaluation and outcomes, interrogating what the idea of impact means, where that term comes from, what does trust mean, who measures uh, CHW programs and how, but more than anything, I think what we've heard over the course of the past few days is just how crucial it is to make sure um, CHW voices are elevated, centered, valued, acknowledged, and heard. Um, and um, yeah, I just really want to thank thank everybody for participating in this conversation and asking your questions. Um, I do want to wrap up just with a couple of highlights from our summit um, over the past couple of days. Please don't you know don't feel obligated to stay and hear them if you need to run. I think um, we do have a short survey, Dina popped that link in the chat. Um, so if folks wanna give us some feedback on today's session, that would be great. It helps us uh, think about what other programming we should be doing um, in the future. Um, so I'll just say real quickly from the past couple of days, um, yesterday um, we heard we, uh, our first keynote was from um, uh, Kate Samuelson, a policy advisor for U.S. Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania, and I thought she did a really um, remarkable job of sort of kicking us off by talking about the complex web of funding mechanisms um, for CHW programs and the strengths and limits of, of all of these mechanisms. And I, I think she, she really energized us to think bigger and bolder and emphasized uh, the importance of CHWs and, and I'll add CHW champions to feel empowered to get more involved in policy making themselves, making their voices heard, reaching out to representatives to tell their stories um, about the work they do and the people they work with. And she spoke about um, moving from the idea of health in all policies to CHWs in all policies that I thought was very uh, compelling. Um, there's some bills in Congress right now that could help provide more funding and support for the CHW workforce, and I think we should really get behind those and support them. And, um, you know, it's not going to be the panacea. It's not going to create uh, sort of sustainable and reliable funding forever, but I think it's a step in the right direction to making sure that CHWs are fairly compensated and acknowledged um, for the full range of services they provide. Um, then we had a panel, um, a really engaging panel on the public health core rollout at Health and Hospitals in New York City, and we sort of had a tour of the CHW interventions that have been implemented, implemented across nearly 20 hospitals um, in adult primary care, pediatrics, their primary care safety net clinic, and um, their port clinics for patients transitioning from jail or prison. We heard from CHWs themselves, um, as well as program and training leads about how they have integrated, trained, uh, hired, trained, and integrated over 250 CHWs and supervisors into their clinical care teams. Um, and uh, then we had a panel highlighting how the Public Health Corps um, uh, CHW workforce has been um, the, the city health department, New York City Health Department sort of roll out of their um, CHW programs through their COVID response. Um, so that was in community-based organizations. So um, we heard from a CHW working in community-based organization and also two CHWs working in primary care clinics and um, how they are making sure patients are getting screened for social needs um, and making referrals while they are also trying to get people um, connected to uh, vaccines. 
Uh, and this morning or earlier today, sorry, we heard from Ramana Rabani about her sort of life experience to becoming a CHW advocate and an advocate for racial justice and equity. Um, and it was really wonderful to hear about her work and activism along um, that of uh, Abdul Hafid bin Abdullah um, and a huge coalition of CHWs and advocates who um, created and have now passed an APHA policy that, that outlines a, a strategy to address racism and violence. Um, and doing that by focusing on, on training and supporting CHWs. So um, they also, both Ramana and Abdullah talked a lot about doing this work through you know, the hard work of, of um, true equitable partnerships and um, acknowledging and valuing uh, CHWs for, for the knowledge and, and the work that, that they do for their knowledge and work. And, and then we just wrapped up with this wonderful panel about um, sort of rethinking, centering CHWs and rethinking what it means to sort of evaluate um, program. I'm not gonna say impact anymore. I mean, I said it, but sorry. <laughs> So uh, that's it for our summit this year. I, I especially want to really thank Dina Pimanova, our senior project coordinator, for all of her help pulling this summit together and keeping us on track and for being a wonderful colleague. Um, and um, please stay tuned for follow-up emails from, from our summit. Um, and I hope to see uh, folks at some of our upcoming events. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us and um, we'll see you soon.